Well, thanks very much. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, so, can you can you see this? Okay. All right. So I have to remember not to stand in front of the speaker. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give you a talk that uh, I take to be kind of optimistic. It's going to be a, a talk about the medium and long run in American politics. Um, but it's, a, it's an encouraging message. You may not agree with it, and uh, if you don't, I hope you'll tell me why. Um, the other thing I want to preface this uh, uh, with is to say that this is new. This is a, a kind of experimental. What I mean by that is this is the first time I've, I've uh, talked about this material. And so uh, I'm very anxious for feedback, especially skeptical feedback. You know, I'm, I'm curious to know why uh, what I say is, uh, is not quite right or wrong. Uh, and, and so on. Um, let me just say one other thing. I'm going to show you some data. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to say a, a fair amount of stuff, talk about a fair amount of stuff. I'm going to show you some data too. Um, if there's material that I go over, I'm going to skip through a lot of it fairly fast and I'm happy to elaborate afterwards. But, but if there are things that you don't understand um, right away, Please just raise your hand and, uh, you know, in other words, if it's a short kind of clarification point, I'd prefer if you just raise your hand and, uh, and I'll try to clarify, you, I'll clarify it for you on the spot uh, rather than coming back to it at the end, although I'm more than happy to, uh, to do that. Okay, so you can see from the title that this is um, in the current American political context somewhat provocative. I'm suggesting to you that uh, we have a big government future. What I mean by that is that I suspect that in coming decades, let's say broadly over the next half century, but I think uh, you know even uh, even earlier than that, we're likely to move toward bigger government rather than staying the same, or or toward smaller government, which is certainly what uh, a fair number of our policymakers um, uh, and policymakers to be uh, would would prefer that we do. I'm going to try to tell you why I, I think this is. Uh, this is in the cards. Uh, so here are some data on one, one way of thinking about or one way of measuring the size of government. It's just how much government spends as a share of the total economy, the total gross domestic product, or GDP, as we call it. It's not the only way to measure the size of government. You, know, you can look at the number of employees or the various things that government does, but this is a pretty standard way, and it's a fairly reasonable way to do it. It gives you a, a basic sense of how large government is relative to, to the economy. And here's the United States along with 19 other rich, fairly long-standing democratic countries with which it's reasonable to compare us. It wouldn't be all that helpful to compare the United States with China or even Brazil, for example, because they're much, much poorer countries. But these are pretty, pretty rich countries. Most of them are in Western Europe. There's also Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan. Um, so we're not quite at the bottom of the list. As of 2007, and I'm showing the data here before the economic crisis because things changed in a, in a big way during the crisis. Uh, government spending as a share of GDP went up uh, a good bit in the United States. But it's not actually because government spending went up all that much, it's because GDP shrank. So the denominator, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about the arithmetic, the denominator shrank a lot, so the, the total figure goes up. That's not, that's not very helpful to know, so I, I'm looking here just at 2007. Um, so uh, roughly a third of our GDP uh, goes through the government, is spent by the, the government in a, a fairly typical year, uh, recently, before the crisis. That's a good bit lower than in most other rich countries, although as you can see there's a, a lot of variation with France, Sweden, and Denmark kind of up near the top. Okay, um, as, I, as I said a moment ago, I think in coming decades we're likely to move toward bigger government. Um, now one reason is, is simple demography and arithmetic. So as you very well know, the baby boom generation is entering retirement now. Uh, we've made commitments, mainly in the form of Social Security and Medicare, that we're not likely to renege on. There are some proposals to, to do that, but I think it's very unlikely to happen. Uh, so as the baby boom generation gets older and older and lives longer and longer, becomes a larger share, the retired uh, portion of the population becomes a larger share of our population, 
there'll be more money spent on these two programs. They're already a big part of our budget. That's going to swell government spending as a, or increase government spending as a share of GDP. So that's kind of, everybody knows about that. Uh, it's very likely to happen. It's going to happen in all of these countries, incidentally. All of them had a, a, a baby boom generation you know, to, with varying sizes. Um, but that's not really what I'm referring to here. Um, what I'm referring to is the fact that I think government spending on a, a variety of programs that do two main types of things. One is to promote opportunity. So the metaphor I, I think of here, other people use this as kind of a springboard. One of the things that our government programs do is to try to enhance opportunity for people. Schooling is the, the kind of quintessential uh, uh, example here of a service that's provided that aims to better prepare people to succeed in life financially, but in other respects, too. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, is a safety net or insurance function. Uh, it aims to provide financial or economic security when things go wrong or when we reach a stage in life where we're not likely to have earned income uh, anymore. So governments do these two main things and do a lot of other things as well, but these are two very, very important functions. Um, why do governments do them well? For some of these tasks, uh, and this is probably a very familiar story to, to many of you, but I, I think it's important to lay it out anyway. So one of the reasons is that private markets don't do a, a great job for some very important tasks in ensuring high quality, affordability, and universal access. Sometimes they provide a really good quality, but it's too expensive. Uh, sometimes they provide quality at a pretty decent price, but uh, they don't, for a variety of reasons, get universal uh, access to or allow, permit, facilitate universal access to it. And then the second thing is, with respect to insurance, it's very, very helpful to have a really large pool. And that's unlikely to happen because you spread the risk. That, that's unlikely to happen in private markets. You think of our health insurance system as a, as a classic example. The pool tends to be fairly small because we have umpteen insurance companies, even though there's been some, some concentration in the last couple of decades. Um, okay, so two very important functions. Um, our government's pretty deficient. It's not terrible. It's much better than in many other countries around the world. That's partly a function of the fact that we're rich. Um, but our government is pretty clearly deficient in a, a number of important respects. And I'll just say some, some quick things here. I don't want to belabor this too much, but either to refresh your memory or, uh, or inform you if you haven't thought about this a whole lot. So with respect to health care. Um, we still have a, a large number of people who don't have access to health insurance. If the 2010 reform is fully implemented, that's going to shrink a lot. But even if it's fully and completely implemented, there'll still be maybe 5 million Americans who don't have health insurance a decade from now, if, if nothing else changes. And a number of other people who are paying more than they, than they ought to, and therefore are, are really strapped. Uh, uh, because of the way our health insurance systems run. Our unemployment compensation system is quite porous. An awful lot of people who probably should qualify don't because of various rules and restrictions that are, that are decided at the state level. Um, we, have no, uh, we have no safety net program to compensate people for the, what's now become a very common situation where you lose a job, find another one. So you don't rely on unemployment compensation or unemployment insurance for very long. So you get a new job, you, you replace your earnings, but the job pays less. In fact, sometimes a whole lot less. Or you get a lot fewer hours, so your total earnings are much less than they otherwise would be. So you do everything that you're supposed to do, you move very quickly back into the labor market, and you know, in the present context, that would count you as a success story, because there are an awful lot of people who can't find their way back in. Um, and, and yet you suffer, your, your income goes down pretty considerably. We could easily compensate for that through a program called wage insurance, which would compensate you for some portion of the differential between your previous earnings and your new earnings. It would be a simple thing to do, but private markets haven't done that. We, we, we ought to. Uh, we have no uh, government paid sickness insurance program, unlike almost every other rich country in the world. Now, a lot of big employers will provide you with paid sick leave if you get sick. You can have a, a week or two weeks, occasionally more a year. Uh, and there are a few states that have a, a, a very small paid <coughs> sickness insurance program. Uh, but most other countries do this through the, the central government. We certainly could as well. Probably we, uh, at some point, will move toward this. We have no mandated paid parental leave uh, program. Again, a number of large private employers will do this. They'll, they'll give you paid parental leave. Um, companies with 50 or more employees are required to, by federal law, to grant unpaid leave uh, to their employees. Uh, but, but not paid leave. And so a whole lot of people, a 
don't get any paid parental leave. Whereas in some other countries around the world, you can get uh, roughly a year off after you have a child. It can often be split between the two parents, by the way. It's not just maternity leave. With, with compensation, often somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of your earnings through that first year. Um, last resort, social assistance. We've, since the 1930s, had uh, first AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Since the mid-1990s, it's called TANF, so what many other countries call social assistance. We also have general assistance. We have what used to be called food stamps. It's now called SNAP, or, uh, <laughs> Supplemental Nutrition, uh, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. Um, uh, an awful lot of people now, in the current context, qualify for food stamps, especially uh, and food stamps hasn't done so bad, but benefit levels for first AFDC and then TANF have been falling pretty steadily since the early 1970s. It wasn't just after the welfare reform in the, in the mid-1990s, to the point where they're now far lower than they, they ought to be, especially given that we have these time limits, which more or less force people back into the labor market after a while. And then lastly, something that I don't think very many policymakers have yet thought about, and not, not very many... Uh, <coughs> sort of policy analysts, whether they're academics or in think tanks or, or elsewhere, have thought about yet. But I'm, I'm worried may increasingly need to be on the agenda. And that's uh, an insurance uh, program for income stagnation. In the last generation, roughly since the early to, to mid to late 1970s, wages in the United States adjusted for inflation from the median on down, so at the midway point of the distribution all the way down to the bottom, haven't increased in real terms. There was one brief period in the mid to late 1990s where they inched up, but over the whole of this period they've effectively been stagnant in inflation adjusted terms. Now incomes, household incomes for this part of the population from the, the midpoint on down have increased some, but most of that's due to adding a second earner. So in the early 1970s, not to mention the 50s and 60s, a stereotypical family with two adults would only have one uh, in employment. Now it has two. And that addition, while not necessarily driven by this wage stagnation, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the fact that more and more women want to work and can earn money, and, that, and that's a good thing that many have been, have been able to. But nonetheless, this is the main reason why uh, incomes have increased at all. And even then, they've increased only a little bit, far less than the economy has grown. So in the couple of decades after World War II, the economy grew nicely, and incomes for households throughout the distribution grew nicely as well. It wasn't just at the top, whether the top 1% or the top 20%. It was all the way down through the bottom. Since the roughly the mid to late 1970s, that hasn't been the case. Incomes have grown at almost all points, but very slowly, and far less than the, than the economy. Um, Given that we may now be at a point, and this has been true more or less since the early 2000s, where this employment solution, adding a second earner, is no longer really a viable solution because our employment rate overall hasn't been increasing. And even if it were, eventually we would run uh, up, up against the end of this as a solution. We'd have all households that have two adults, both of them would be in the labor force, and then you can't add anymore. So there, there was always going to be an end point to the way that we sort of solved, as it were, that, uh, that problem of wage stagnation in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s by adding a second earner. But it, this is accentuated or worsened by the fact that it seems like uh, uh, we may not be increasing employment much. Uh, we haven't since the early 2000s. It's not just uh, in the last couple of years due to the crisis. Given that, um, I think we probably ought to be thinking much more seriously about some type of insurance mechanism to, uh, to guard against wage stagnation, to ensure that uh, not just for families at the bottom, we already have a, a pretty nice program called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which helps ensure that for a, a fairly small set of families at the bottom, their household incomes can continue to go up even if their wages stagnate, even if, they don't, even if wages don't go up along with the economy. Probably we need to be thinking about extending that up further in the income distribution so that let's call it the lower working class, maybe even part of the middle class, has some insurance uh, to guard against this, this income stagnation, if it in fact uh, is likely to continue. Um, and then an opportunity, uh, I think I better get moving a little more quickly so I don't uh, have a lot more to say. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, go, go too much over my time. Um, I, I think we have three main deficits with respect to opportunity. Uh, our, our schooling, our kindergarten through 12th 
grade, our, our, our main schooling system, kindergarten, elementary, and secondary schooling, coupled with uh, university education, could use a lot of work. There are a number of changes we could make. But the big lack here, I think, is in early education. We do very little below kindergarten. We're way behind a number of other countries, and there's a whole lot of evidence. It's not airtight. I think there's some, still some room for dispute. But there's a whole lot of very recent evidence that suggests it matters a great deal, especially to kids in disadvantaged families, families with low incomes, with one parent, with other kinds of disruptions, live in not so great neighborhoods, what have you, uh, that, that this is very beneficial to bring them into to, uh, an affordable and high quality educational type experience, not just child minding, not just uh, sticking a kid in front of the TV, but an educational experience uh, at very, very young ages, and we do very, very little of this. Almost all Americans can get access to child care and preschool, whether it's parking your kid with the neighbor down the street. We, we have a very unregulated uh, child care system, and so it's fairly affordable, but the quality is the, the key concern here. So we, we probably ought to, and I suspect, uh, you know, once our finances recover, over the medium and long run, we, we will move to, uh, to to bringing the age at which uh, most kids, if not all kids, begin the schooling experience much, much lower uh, in the life cycle. Um, secondly, we need to do a lot more with respect to managing what's now a very flexible labor market. It's pretty clear, it's been clear for a while, but it's abundantly clear now that most people who enter the labor market shouldn't expect to stay with the same ex employer for their entire life, maybe not even 10 years or five years. People are transitioning increasingly between jobs whether because of economic cycles or just because employers uh, are consistently trying to find uh, new uh, and better ways to cut costs and a lot of times that means laying off uh, employees even in good times. Um, and so there's a lot more we need to do whether it's job training or access to lifelong learning, being able to go back to college, get an additional degree, uh, job placement, help with geographical relocation which is an an increasingly important issue now because fewer people can sell their homes in the way that they used to, to be able to in the, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Uh, and then lastly, I, I, I think uh, although we do much better now than we did 20 years ago, let's say, with respect to people with physical, cognitive, emotional, social, uh, and other types of disabilities, we have a, a long way to go here too in terms of making it easier for uh, people who are coming out of the labor market or in the middle of the uh, of their working years but who have various types of disabilities uh, to get the most out of their uh, employment and, and earning potential. Uh, so these are just illustrations of areas in which on the security side and the opportunity side, the safety net side and the springboard side, our set of government programs, although it's not terrible as I said, you know, compared to much, much of the rest of the world, we're pretty advanced, <coughs> but we have a long way to go. There are big gaps, in other words, uh, that ought to be filled. Given this need, I think there will be uh, a fair amount of pressure, whether it's uh, simply wise, foresighted policymakers seeing the need for this, uh, or pressure groups uh, from society, or hopefully uh, a combination of the two, not, not to mention uh, the political parties, especially the, the, the Democratic Party. So I suspect we're likely to see movement uh, in the direction of filling in these holes, if you will, in, in our uh, safety net and springboard. Okay, um, but is that in fact likely to happen? Uh, is it likely to play out in the form of, if you will, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using the term bigger government in some ways just provocatively here. Uh, I want to emphasize that hardly anybody wants bigger government for its own sake. The, the point is that there's a need for this. There are really valuable things that government can do, and our government in, in some ways has done quite well over the last uh, two-thirds of a century, roughly speaking, which, which gives me some confidence that it could do these additional things to it, too. Um, but uh, there's a lot of grounds for reasons for pessimism. I'm going to focus on three here and, and uh, try to walk you through why I'm, I think, less pessimistic than many people. Uh, these are very reasonable objections or grounds for skepticism. So first is Americans don't want big government. Second is that the left is losing its electoral base. So even if Americans were okay with an expanded government, the, the left, which is the most likely side of the political spectrum to try to, to, to do this, to push these policies into place, may not be able to. It, it, it may not uh, be in a position. And then thirdly, even if the left is, that is to say even if Democrats or you know, sympathetic uh, people from other parties 
uh, do get elected, the structure of our political system puts big obstacles uh, in the way of those who would like to, to introduce or expand the, the kinds of policies that I've just talked about. Okay, so let me start with uh, obstacle number one. Americans don't want big government. Um, the, the argument here uh, calls on uh, what I think is a very commonplace notion and to some degree sensible, which is that uh, we have small government. When I say small government, I mean relative to other rich countries around the world. I don't mean relative to nations in Africa, let's say, which are really, really poor, and so of course they have fairly small government. Um, we have small government relative to other people according to this argument because that's exactly what Americans want. And of course in a democracy it's public opinion that drives the, the kind of policies that get put in place and that, that stick around over, over time. Um, uh, academics, some, some scholars have tried to, tried to state and investigate this hypothesis a, a little more precisely and the notion is something like what, uh, what I show up here on the screen. So public opinion surveys show pretty clearly that Americans, more than their counterparts in many other rich countries, think that effort is what drives people's success in life. Whereas people in many, let's say, Western European countries are much more likely to say luck is really important. It's not that they utterly or entirely discount effort, it's just that they think luck plays a really prominent role. Some Americans do too, but fewer Americans do. We tend to think effort is much more important. They therefore see, we therefore see uh, less of a need than, uh, than others for government assistance in all kinds of areas, whether it's opportunity or safety net or what have you. And that's why we have a smaller government than in rich countries. Here are just a couple of examples of, uh, I can come back to this if you want, uh, of some books that, uh, that argue this, this thesis or, or this hypothesis. And here's a little chart uh, that comes from this third book, uh, Fighting Poverty in the U.S. and Europe, written by a group of economists, Alberto Alcina and Ed Glazer. Um, this is a chart in, in their book that shows, running along the horizontal axis here, the share of uh, people who think that luck is the, the key determinant of income. And you can see that Denmark's over here far to the right, and the Netherlands and Sweden. We're way over here to the left. So a smaller, as I just said a second ago, a smaller share of Americans than uh, their counterparts in other countries think luck is a, a really important driver of individual outcomes. And on the vertical axis is just a measure of, the, if you will, the generosity of social programs, or the welfare state, we, we might call it. And you can see there's a nice association, as you might expect, and, and consistent with the hypothesis I just laid out between the two. The further you go to the right, the, the more the people in your country believe that luck is a really important driver of outcomes, the more the government ends up spending, presumably because that's exactly what the people want. And we're down in the lower left corner with Fewer people believing in luck, more in effort, and we have a much smaller government in this respect. Um, okay, so a plausible hypothesis uh, and some evidence that seems consistent with it, but is it really is it really true, or to what degree is it true? Um, I'm I'm skeptical, mainly because I tend to think that the causality goes in exactly the other direction. I think, for the most part, it's government policies that determine or influence people's attitudes toward these types of things rather than the other way around. So it's not, for example, that Swedes or Danes are born uh, believing that luck is really important and therefore demand a bigger government, whereas we as Americans are born or are taught early in uh, our lives that it's all about effort, and so consequently we say, no, no, uh, don't expand government. That's exactly what you, you'd think from uh, a lot of what you see in a lot of journalistic accounts and what you could surmise from these types of data. Um, but I, I, I tend to, to, to think that it's not right, that the causality runs in the other direction. So if we look at public opinion, what we see, political scientists and others who've studied uh, uh, public opinion survey data for a long time, uh, have known this for quite some time. And Americans are, we might say, ideologically conservative. In the abstract, we don't like the idea of big government. We think government ought to stay smaller or stay out of our lives as much as possible. But when you get down to specific policies, it turns out that we're pretty fond of a lot of policies that when you add them up, <laughs> equate to big government. Uh, I'll show you some uh, some data. Uh, okay, so here's a question from the Pew Research Center, uh, combined with some, uh, some similar questions from uh, various news services, uh, like the New York Times and CBS and ABC and so on, that go back to the, the late 1970s, I think. So this is a question that says, if forced to choose, uh, would you prefer a smaller government with fewer services or a bigger government with more services? 
And this is the ch share choosing bigger <coughs> government. It almost never gets over 50%. So basically people are forced to choose one or the other. And in most, uh, at most points in time, so down around here, it's, it's anywhere from 25 to maybe 40, 45%. Suggesting that there's not a big demand in the United States for bigger government than we already have. And bear in mind that, again, relative to other countries, we don't already have a very big government. It's fairly small. This is consistent with this notion that at a general level, we don't, we don't really like the idea of big government. Here's a question that uh, Gallup has asked for, uh, kind of episodically, uh, since the, all the way back to the late 1960s. It says, in your opinion, what's the biggest threat, or what will be the biggest threat to the country in the future? And you're, you're forced to cho choose between big business, big labor, and big government. Now, back in the early 1970s, um, maybe 20, 25% of people chose big labor. Not surprisingly, nowadays, almost nobody thinks big labor is likely to be a, a threat. Uh, in the future. So it's either big government or big uh, business. And a pretty large share of Americans tend to say uh, big government is the, the large. I haven't shown you the, the data for the, uh, or the trend lines for the other two choices, the big government, uh, sorry, the big business and big labor. Uh, but it's well over 50% for most of the period since the, uh, the early 1980s, thinking that big government is the, the largest threat to the future. And currently, I think they asked this question just a, a few months ago, and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, 65%. Um, here's another question that uh, confirms or supports this notion that at, at, at an abstract or general level we don't really like big government. It's a question that um, a political science survey, the National Election Studies, asked for uh, quite some time that, that uh, uh, says um, people in government waste uh, a lot or some or not very much of the, uh, of the money that we pay in taxes and you can say uh, in most years, a sizable majority of Americans think the correct answer is a lot. Uh, the money that we pay in taxes is wasted by the, by the government. Not some, not, not very much, but a lot. Uh, and then lastly, I think this is the last one I have on this, uh, on this point. Um, here's the share. Uh, this is from some Pew surveys since the late 1980s. Um, you agree that when something's run by government, it's usually inefficient and wasteful, and a fairly sizable uh, majority of Americans consistently saying yes, uh, that, uh, agreeing or strongly agreeing with uh, this statement. Um, okay, but when we, as, I, as I said a moment ago, when we turn to specific programs, uh, you get a very different picture. So um, the General Social Survey, another large-scale public opinion survey that's been around for, uh, for about four decades, they started asking this question, uh, in the early 1980s, I think, it said, uh, do you think that we're spending, with regard to spending on assistance for the poor, are we spending too little, or is it about right, or are we spending too much? And you can see that a pretty sizable majority, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 65 percent in most years, think that we're spending too little on assistance to the poor. Now, you can sort of laugh this off and say, well, we don't really spend uh, that much money on the, the poor, so it's maybe it's not that surprising that people would think we should spend more, and it's not a huge part of our budget, so even if we did spend more, this isn't really going to drive us to much bigger government. But let's look at a, a couple of uh, areas where we do already spend a lot of money, big, big programs, in, in this case a, a service, education. Same type of question, it's been asked since the early 1970s. And even in the, the 70s, we had slightly more than half, but since then, close to 75% saying we should spend more, even though we already spend a fair amount, we should spend more on our educational system. We currently spend too little, in other words. You see a similar trend for health care. Um, you may notice that uh, when the question was asked in 2010, it dips down a lot. That's right around the time when there was a lot of controversy about uh, the, uh, what was at that time the health care reform bill. Was, uh, was before. No, actually, I take that back. This is, I think, right after the, the question was asked, right after it was, uh, it was actually passed in, the early two, in early 2010. In any event, there was so much controversy around it that uh, it's not so surprising that that dipped down. I'd be surprised if it doesn't, uh, doesn't go back up. And even then, you see, I think it was 55, 60 percent uh, or so uh, thinking that we're, we're currently spending too little on improving and protecting the nation's health. Again, we already spend an awful lot of money through Medicare and Medicaid and some related programs. And then lastly, uh, Social Security, which is, a, as you probably know, a huge expenditure and likely to already get bigger uh, uh, as we go forward. Uh, consistent majority, with the exception of one uh, uh, very brief period in the early 1990s, saying that we're currently spending too little money on Social Security. Um, okay, so how do we account for this 
this, uh, this pattern that we find. Opposition to big government in the abstract, but support for big government when you get down to specific policies. And what does it mean for the notion that uh, dislike of big government is a, is a key obstacle to future expansion of, of government in coming decades?